Tonight, we spend the hour with Pat Riley. In the 1980s, Pat Riley and the Lakers made basketball history by winning four NBA titles and seven trips to the finals. His Lakers became the first team in 19 seasons to win back-to-back -back championships when they beat the Detroit Pistons in 1988. So when Riley came to New York, explaining that there are only two things in basketball life, winning and misery, fans and indeed the players listened. In two seasons, Riley had the New York Knicks and Patrick Ewing contending for the title for the first time in 20 years. Now the question is whether Pat Riley, the 1992-93 NBA Coach of the Year, can take the Knicks yet another level higher. He joins me now to talk about that and a life in sports. Welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. Did the 1992-3 Knicks um, not make it all the way because the opponent was better or they didn't live up to their potential? We didn't get it done. I mean, I mean, it, it, it gets to the point, uh, you know, I'm very kidding about this just prior to this yeah. question, you know, about the great Ted Williams trying to uh, <laughs> give some solace to a young rookie who had gotten to the plate. He said, God can get you to the plate, but he can't hit it for you, you know? And uh, I, th I think what, you know, what we accomplished this year uh, you know, it was very significant when you're trying to build and trying to grow, but we just simply didn't get it done. Whether Chicago was better than us, I mean, you can argue that point until you're blue in the face. We had a chance. We were right there, and, uh, and the opportunities that, that presented themselves, we just did not execute and get it done, but there'll always be another day. Yeah. What do you have to do between now and next season to build this team and make it tougher and stronger and better? I think, I think this team has... You've gotten the toughness down. <laughs> <laughs> toughness they have. <laughs> they got it down. <laughs> In and your words, a physical culture. Right, right. No, and they understand exactly what, you know, what the whole thing is about here. And, um, you know, I, it's been my experience in, in this league, especially at this level when you're playing for championships. There are 27 teams that start in October. And 26 teams know there's only going to be one. And, and the thing about about championship play I always say this to players is that you know it's like a cycle every year there's another champion so it isn't unless they crown somebody champion forever then we're all going to be miserable the rest of our life but we always get another chance to come back and and I think what it's going to take for this team and I think it takes it with every team is that and, and we're trying to fast track is that you have to go through a, a process of pain and and you have to realize just you know, you got to want something so much that it hurts. And, um, and this hurt us this year because everybody, the players, management, the media, in, in a very objective way, the fans, uh, they got behind the passion uh, of this team. They watched the team really give everything they had to give, and they came up short, and everybody felt very disappointed because of that. And I think that's normal when you're really trying to achieve something that's significant. So I think it's good for us. You know, I, I wanted to win it this year. Everybody wanted to win it this year. But I think it's good to go through this period. And it, and it really will show us just how together we are. It builds character or tests character? Competition, the very best competition, brings out the very best or very worst in an individual. That's just, you know, it's a normal process of competition. And it should strengthen your character and your resolve and make you more resilient. And, you know, I, uh, Norman Vincent Peale is somebody that I read a long time ago, and the only thing that I took out of his, his, his work that really stays in my mind, and I've taken a lot of, of it out of it, in every adversity there's a seed of equivalent benefit, and it's up to you as an individual and as a team to find that seed of equivalent benefit. What is the benefit that came out of, out of this loss? And, and, and I think what's, what we're going to benefit from it is that we were not mentally tough enough and that comes with dealing with adversity and they have to make themselves mentally tough or you have to quote whip them into shape no it is it's not about that it's a it's a teamwork is the essence of life it's the essence of life in business and sports and in family i mean anybody that's part of a group you have a group mm -hmm. of people here that significant group to put this whole thing together and it really is the essence of life it, it it's like you know, it's a sort of a profound statement to me because I've been around nothing but teams my whole life. I mean, it's all I know is the dynamics of teamwork. And, you know, I mean, you know, you break it down as an acronym and it's, you know, togetherness and equality and attitude and meshing and we and organization and roles and being kindred spirits to one another. It doesn't happen overnight. I don't whip it into anybody. 
uh, I always ask the team, what is it going to take for us to become a together team? Do we have to win to come together? Or do you have to be successful to like one another to come together? Or do you have to become together in order to win? I mean, that's an interesting question. Sometimes. And, and what are the answers? I think you have to become a together team before you win. Anybody can win. We won 60 yeah. games. Anybody can yeah. win. Winning in the NBA during the regular season, to me, is nothing more than trying to position yourself for the big win. I mean, you have to be a together team to win it all. And I think there's the moot point. There, is no, there are those who say that you are one superstar away from a great team. That if you look at the Bulls, there is Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. If you looked at the Lakers, there was Kareem and Michael. I mean, Kareem and Magic. Right. Are, you, are they right about that? Three positions have to be productive. You've got to have three players on a team that you can count on every night and that you know uh, what you're going to get from, you know, from an offensive standpoint. Players that can really sort of transcend the game and, and get it done. Uh, we have one in Patrick. Uh, we're developing other players, I think, on a regular basis, uh, younger players that we hope will get to that level. Uh, but, I mean, the Jordans, Chicago has the ring, they're on the throne, and they happen to have the biggest cannon. Michael Jordan is the greatest offensive weapon in the history of the game since Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and his skyhook. And it's a great equalizer. Uh, he has the ability to be able to create uh, after everything has gone awry and, and to get the job done. And Patrick Ewing has the ability to do the same thing. Whether we need another one, I don't know. I, I think if the team gets stronger and we develop some of our younger players, uh, I don't think that is necessary. And I don't think we have to use that as an excuse for not winning because uh, you know, they don't grow them on trees. <laughs> you know, I'd like to have one drop out of the sky, but, you know, you've got to develop What would you like to have drop out of the sky most? We need, uh, we need things, uh, you know, on our team, uh, I think, that come uh, from skilled development more than anything else. And, and so there isn't any one player. Uh, I mean, we can become a better ball handling team. We can become a better passing team. We can become a better playmaking team. We're a big muscle team. We rebound. We're the best rebounding team in the league. We're the best defensive team in the league. We make big time stops. We have players that have great courage uh, who stand up and step in front of the ball. They don't, they're not concerned about their careers. I mean, they want to win, but we need more skill development. Players that can create a little bit, and I have to give them the freedom to go one-on-one -on -one in a crucial time to create a shot or a play. We have a couple of players that are, are being developed that way. And I think John Starks is a good example of a player that isn't very far away from being that kind of player. So there isn't any one player, but there are a number of, of skills that can be developed by our guys. What is it you like about John Stark? Um, John is, um, he's, you know, he's a warrior. You know, the, the, you know, I, and I don't know how to explain it. You know, I mean, it's, you know, there's a great Indian quote, you know, it's about the Shawnee. I'm a Shawnee Indian. Uh, my forefathers were warriors. Uh, their sons were warriors. Uh, they take nothing from the tribe, and they are the maker of their own fortune. To me, that's John. You know, John is, is a warrior. He's a Shawnee Indian. He takes nothing from the team, and he's the maker of his own fortune. That's how he got to this point. I respect, you know, what John had to go through to get here. And the fact that he's here, he's a hard worker, he plays with his heart. Sometimes his emotions, you know, go. But uh, I said it one time, and I'll say it again, that I'd like to be in his foxhole <laughs> when it got tough. You know, he's just that kind of person. And, and he's willing to grow. I mean, players that are willing to grow, and you know, he's, uh, he works hard, he wants to get better, he's learning how to become a leader, and I think What's important to him now is that he knows he has to become more responsible because we really depend on him. Yeah. Let me take you back. You talked about growing to your own growth, growing up in Schenectady. Uh, two people who seem to have had significant influence, and I'll talk about your dad in a second, but Walt Prisbo? Prisbo. Prisbo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, your high school coach. Right. What was it about him that impacted on you? 
Well, you know, he grabbed me by the back of the neck. <laughs> Scruff it, said, Riley, come here. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, he was that kind of guy. You know, he saw this kid who was, uh, you know, running around. I mean, I was a product <laughs> at that time of my environment. and Wh Which and also, was? Which was. I mean, we're in the mid-50s. I mean, uh, it was about the Dell Vikings and yeah. the Dubs and the <laughs> Chapel of Dreams, and it was about the Wild One and Marlon Brando and... Uh, Rebel Without a Cause, and I mean, it was about that time, and um, and so I was part of that. Uh, I wasn't a bad, bad kid. I mean, more that is, I mean, the myth grows. You know? I know it does. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, I broke a few windows and yeah. broke into a cafeteria one time and drank up all the milk. Before well, there we are also the dinner. stories of you going into the woods and, and cleaning up on all the bikers who yeah, were there yeah, and, you know, and taking their money that. and then having to fight your way out. We used to arm wrestle a lot. We did that, but again, the myth grows, but uh, Walt Prisblow was like my father in a lot of ways uh, a very disciplined voice yeah. early in my life and you know when he got me involved in basketball in a meaningful way mm -hmm. you know one of my basketball coaches in junior high school was the English teacher you know and when you have an English teacher you know teaching you how to co how, how to play the game and what he's trying to do is teach you punctuation yeah. and you know you know an exclamation points I mean that and then all of a sudden, a man comes into your life that really coaches you. You need a coach. And uh, I got a coach at that time in basketball, and he helped me. And a motivator. Yes. Yeah, would you know, give these a, extraordinary yeah. talks about, he was, a, he was a survivor of the Battle of the Bulge? He was uh, a World War II veteran, yeah. yes. And he, uh, uh, he talked about life, you know, 30 minutes a day. He was a great storyteller. I mean, we'd sit down there. We'd go through school, and then at 3.15, we'd go down to practice, and then... Every day we walked into practice, we never picked up a ball. We went in and put our backs up against the bleachers, and we all just sat there, and we waited, and he'd come out, and he would go, and he'd start talking about some subject or about some experience that he had, or he'd talk about one of us and, and yeah. one of his teachers. I got a letter today from, you know, the chemistry teacher, Patton, and, and he, would, he would make a point out of yeah. it. He'd make a valid point out of it. So I, I think, you know, when you have people like that in your life, you don't value them until you get much yeah. older. How about Adolf Rupp? He was, uh, he was Schwarzkopf. <laughs> 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 he was, uh, he's a great, great uh, presence. Uh, this is the basketball coach at the University, University of Kentucky. University of Kentucky, and he was a disciplinarian. And, and I take basically, you know, a lot of my philosophy from his coaching because I had four years of a, of a very drill type mentality there. I mean, you could not speak in practice. You could not talk to your teammate. You could not smile. Uh, everything was to the second, to the minute, drill to drill, to station to station. And uh, but that's the way it was in the 50s and 60s. There was nothing wrong with discipline. I mean, I didn't want to play for a coach who wouldn't push me. I didn't want that. I didn't want to be around somebody who was going to be one of the guys. Did you have to have the coach there to push you? Or were no. you the kind of guy that was going to push yourself? No, I don't think, I think I was pretty self-motivated. Yeah. But I think it's different today. I think, I think all of society is different in, in how, they, um, how they will take direction, teaching, coaching, leadership. I think it's changed and it has become very fashionable that, you know, those kinds of coaches or those kinds of leaders uh, will not be successful today because, you know, players, kids, students, employees won't deal with it anymore. Your dad, Lee Riley. Right. Yeah. What influence? Uh, he was uh, a survivor. You know, he, uh, 25 years um, in professional baseball in the minor leagues. And uh, it's a long time. Yeah. And always trying to, you know, get to that level, you know, just to get a cup of coffee with one of the major league teams. And he never made it. And so, he was very frustrated by that. He was good enough to manage in the major leagues? No, no. He, he managed in the Philadelphia Philly organization. And, uh, and there was a time in his career where he was supposed to, uh, and I think maybe even promised the job with the Philadelphia Phillies. As a coach or manager? As the manager. And they put somebody else in ahead of him. And, uh, you know, and he said, hey, this is enough. You know, I gave his sort of his life to that organization or a long time to it. And, uh, and so he left the game in, a, in sort of a bitter state because of that. You remember that? I was very young. It was, I was four or five years old, mm -hmm. you know, but I don't remember that. I do remember him 
settling down, and I do remember us not traveling anymore from borough to borough or burg, burg to burg. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we, we calmed down and, and resided then in Schenectady, New York, and he went into the private business, but, uh, but I could sense his, his displeasure for years after that. That the frustration right. that he not gave. Not being able to fulfill, you know, maybe yeah. his lifelong dream, which was to manage a major league team. And, uh, and I never had a chance to really sit down and talk to him about it. He never said, hey, this is what they did to me, or this is what happened. You know, I mean, even my mother very rarely ever talked about it. But, but it ended uh, very bitterly, and, uh, and he carried that with him for a long time. Did he get to see you be an All-American and a first-round draft yeah. choice? Yeah, he, he got to see, uh, uh, he got to see my, my high school career, and uh, he never came to many games because he was always working. And uh, he, he never really came down to Kentucky. He followed us very closely in the press, and he used to drive his car up to the hill in Central Park where he, it was high enough where his, his radio could get WHAS in, yeah. in Louisville, Kentucky, and he'd listen to Kay Wood Lefford. Uh, do all the Kentucky games, but he very rarely ever got down to see me play. But uh, he was a big fan from a distance. You know. When did you see him last? I mean, did he? I saw him in 1970 uh, when Chris and I uh, were getting married. We got married. It was, it was one of those great marriages. You know, I was five thousand dollars in debt. You know, I had a 1967 Corvette, pipes <laughs> on the side. I had what four. color? It was yellow, yeah. convertible. I had four Four Tops records, about yeah. three Temptation records, mm -hmm. king size bed, plastic plant, <laughs> and we were getting married. <laughs> I had everything and you my needed. Career, my yeah. career was sort of like, you know, I was cut by the uh, San Diego Rockets and I was put on the expansion draft, and now, you know, I was headed up to Portland with 27 other veteran players to try to make a team. And so my, my basketball career at that particular time was sort of in a state of flux. and. Uh, and at that time, when I was getting married, my father had come out and we had spent a good portion of the time he was out there talking about this. One of the, one of the, the very, very few times that we really had a chance to sit down and for him to really sit across the table and give me some advice about, about my career and about what to do. So know. what did he tell you? He told me not to do what he did. Not to give up? Right. Not to leave. You know, I mean, you see, you know, Fight to the last breath. Well, you know, he was talking about, you know, I was very bitter about the San Diego Rockets uh, putting me on the expansion draft and I had to leave San Diego. It was my very first sort of being traded or cut, you know, and I was very upset with that. And, uh, you know, he said, this is going to be a, a, an ongoing journey to what you want. You know, I mean, this is an opportunity for you. But you know, I just remember it was, it was a very good time for me because he did encourage me tremendously yeah. to go to Portland and uh, yeah, the, there, there evidently is a great quote somewhere where he said at some point you got to take your stand and right. kick butt. Right, right. But he used to make that point to us all the time when I was a kid. But uh, you know, the last time I saw him was was when he was in um, after the the wedding reception. Uh, he and mother, uh, we took him downstairs and put him in Chris's parents' old 1965. It was a red Chevrolet Caprice had Primer on the side. Frank was forever always beating his cars up, Frank, Chris's dad, and primering them. And, yeah. and, uh, and we put him in the back seat of the car, and uh, one of Chris's brothers was riding them back to the house, and uh, Chris and I were headed on a midnight flyer to Hawaii. And uh, as, he was, as he was moving away, I can remember him sort of sticking his head out the window. You yeah. know, he was like waving to me, and and he, at the same time, was yelling uh, something, and uh, and I was I was sort of chasing after the car, and he was, he made that statement to me again about, uh, you know, somewhere, you know, someplace, sometime, you got to plant your feet, stand firm, and make a point about who you are and what you believe in, you know, and uh, and when that time comes, you do it, you know. He made that statement to me when I was 11, 12 years old too, when I was a very young boy. Uh, ironically, uh, it was the very last words I ever heard him say because he passed away that summer and uh, I never saw him again after that. But I think in our minds uh, as people, as we continue to grow and move on in life, there's always a voice. There has to be a voice uh, that comes from deep inside somewhere that, that will inspire or motivate or allow you to sort of break through. And, and his voice has been very, very strong in, in my mind, even though... You know, he's been gone for 23 years. Yeah. But you deeply regret you never had a chance to see him and have one conversation oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in which you sort of squared life. 
Well, you know, I think everybody... Every, fa every son wants to do it with every right, father at right. some and, point. And I, we didn't. You know, yeah. we, we never had that chance to sit down, you know, and, uh, and really, you know, say the things to each other that we wanted to say. I mean, I was too embarrassed as a young man to say them, and, and obviously probably he was too much of a dad uh, to want to say them. But I, I do know that, you know, as if I was in my 30s, I would have had that conversation like in a minute with him, and even if he didn't want to, you know, I would grab him by the lapels and I would have <laughs> sat him down. But, you know, I say that all the time to, uh, to players that I talk to and uh, uh, about their fathers and, 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 and any player or person that I meet that has a problem with his dad and he said, or mom, he says, ah, they won't listen to me, I don't pay any attention to him. you know, I, hey, <laughs> do it, you know, you will regret it one day. And, and I think it's, it's our responsibility to, uh, to do that as children, as we grow. Just to say everything that's on your mind. Not to say everything, but uh, I mean, you've got to come to peace with it somewhere. Mm. Because if you don't, it's going to be torture, I think, for you. And uh, later on in life, especially if uh, you, know, you get that telephone call, you know, the one in the middle of the night. And then the money came early in the morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, so, you know, I mean, it, uh, uh, it, it is a very powerful uh, presence. His presence is still very powerful in my life. How significant a disappointment was it to you to, to not be a star in the pros? Mm -hmm. I never thought about it. You know, I, I knew, I never thought about it that way. When I came into the NBA, uh, I was a star at the University of Kentucky. And, and a first-round draft choice. All of those things. And, you know, I, I brought all the credentials with me. And I found out in my first training camp just how competitive this was going to be. <laughs> this was another zone. Yes, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I could not even get the ball, you know, up <coughs> across half court at times. And, um, I mean, the players are just so much better. And, and they're so much bigger and they're so much quicker. And they had so many more skills. Uh, but I learned quickly, and I think players have to learn this quickly, where you stand in the league. You've got to see it where you stand. And, and if you don't find your place immediately, then, then you'll be gone. You'll be out of there. You've got to find a place where you can play and be part of a team. And, and I learned that when I came to Los Angeles in 1970. I learned, I really learned how to be a role player and to take pride in, in that role, whatever that role was. Well, at, at one time it was said that the role was that you were to go out there and make Jerry West work hard in practice. When I left, uh, when I went to, to Portland, and then Portland cut me, and, and the Lakers picked me up, um, I think they got me for $1,000 or something, and then Chris and I took our Corvette and our plastic Same Corvette. And our, we left the bed <laughs> in Portland, but we ended up migrating back to Los Angeles and we're back in Southern California, so we were happy with that. But uh, Fred Schaus, the general manager at that time, of the Los Angeles Lakers, you know, he pulled me aside in training camp and he said, look, do you want to make this team? And I said, yes, you know, I, I wanted a job, you know, and uh, he said, your job is going to be to keep Jerry West and Jimmy McMillan in shape. I mean, he really wanted me, you know, as the 12th player on the team or the 11th or 10th or whatever, but somebody who's not in the rotation to come to practice, to work hard and to make these guys work. And, and so that's what I did. And I tried to do it the best that I could. And, you know, Jerry to this day is still very upset with me. You know, because, you know, he'd play 48 <laughs> minutes one night, and the next day here I am drooling, you know, you know, beating this guy up, up and down the court, you know, but, but he understood that's what I had to do. You came to coaching by accident. In a way. I think it was always in the back of my mind. Because of your father, because of way. people yeah. that, yeah. I mean, the broadcast booth, and, and a fellow was injured in a bicycle, yeah. and yeah, he I, became uh, assistant I used coach. to do a lot of clinics when I was a player, and I felt very good. Uh, I'd be a guest speaker. I'd go to basketball clinics. There'd be a couple hundred kids and, and, and teaching drills and teaching things. I felt very comfortable doing it as a player. And, um, and I, I was asked to coach at camps and stuff like that when I was a player. So it was in the back of my mind, but when you're playing the game, you think you're never ever going to not be a player. You don't think your career is ever going to be over with, you know, and we find out just how quick it comes. But uh, yes, I, I, I got out of the league, and then I took a year off. I came back as a broadcaster, traveling secretary. I actually used to hand out boarding passes to the players, and, and uh, 
players used to throw them back at me. You know, I don't want 1A. I want 1D, and I don't want to sit next to that guy. You know, so so I, I've had, I've worn a lot of different hats. This glamorous career went through a lot of But you were able through, throughout that to maintain your sense of who you were and your dignity and your sense of... I think we're, as I mentioned, a product of our environment. We're a product of our education, who, you know, who taught us. When I got the opportunity to coach, and, and I worked first under Paul Westhead, right. uh, you know, who was a lifetime coach, very disciplined man, and you realize just how much you don't know about coaching and drilling and planning and organization until you're asked to do it. Uh, he taught me a lot in the organizational manner. He gave me uh, a lot of responsibility. In the summer, I had the team in summer league, so I, I got to coach them at that particular time. I had them in practice where I could coach them. And, and I spent two or three years early really studying coaching. Studied Knight, Smith, Newell, Wooden, just studied them. All high school, I mean, all college coaches. Well, at that time, yes, because mm -hmm. they're the ones that were writing the books and they were the yeah. ones that were planning clinics. And uh, very rarely were there pro coaches that, that really had published a lot of stuff, you know. But, but that's where you went to get maybe your coaching background. And uh, so I spent two or three years, four years really trying to study the art of coaching before I realized you know, that, that it really had to come from me. If I took you and Chuck Daly and Phil Jackson and, and uh, let's say even John Lucas at the pro level, what do you think you would share? What qualities would you share? You're all successful other than good players. I think there's a common, there has to be a common denominator when it comes to coaching. And, and again, we were talking you know, prior to us going on the air about the decorum. Right. And to me, coaching is about dignity. It's about integrity. It's about trust. It's about respect. Uh, coaching is an interactive process in which you interact with players to try to get them to do something in order to achieve a result. I mean, that's what it is. It's an interactive process. And the only way that process can work is if there is incredible trust there and integrity, uh, which is simply one's sense of obligation, a fine sense of one's obligation to that player. So players will not let you coach them, really coach them unless they trust you. And the only way they can trust you is that there has to be a sincerity there. They know that you're not conning them. They know that you're not using them to get something else out of it. Uh, they know that they will only let you coach them if they feel like you're competent and that you can converse with them in a competent manner. And they will only let you coach them if you're reliable. So I think, I think all of those men, if we were to sit down at a table, I think, I think they could all talk about trust and reliability and competence and integrity and those things that, that really players demand in a way. You to know. learn that, I mean, are you saying that by coaching clinics and a lot of other things that you got that there, or did you get that back from your father and from Walt and from Rupp and some just growing up and developing a code and a standard of living? That coaching to me is, is that. It's coaching. We have all had them. See, when, when I was in the CYO or in Biddy Basketball or, or, or sometime, you know, I remembered when I would look at my coach, even my seventh grade coach, and I looked at him in awe because I always felt that the coach knew what he was talking about and that he had some wisdom and that there was some experience there and that he would help us. Uh, I really respect the profession at that level. And all of us in our life, have all had a coach at some level. You know, we may not have all been athletes, but we've had a, a PE coach or we've had some kind of gymnastics coach or a, a little league coach. And, and I think it's our responsibility to take that, you know, that, that word and that title and, and to use it the way that it, it's supposed to be used. So coaching is about dignity and respect and pride and trust. And, and that's the decorum in which I think coaches have to carry themselves or should carry themselves and in a way they almost have to be beyond reproach in a lot of ways. Beyond fear? 
no, no. beyond vulnerability? No. Yeah. No. Uh, leadership and coaching is defining reality. And if you're scared to death one day, you, I mean, they're going to see it. You know, I mean, I mean, there, I mean, well, I mean, one of the great sayings is, is, is that, you know, there's, there's no fear in being afraid. Or, you know, I mean, that's part of competition. We all feel this anxiety, and, uh, and I think that's what motivates a lot of people. Uh, but when it comes down to, to coaching and teaching players and getting players to really know themselves and to understand what competition is all about and defining that reality every day. See, that's all Walt Priswell did to us. Yeah. We didn't even know it. It was defining reality every day. Leadership is defining reality. It's telling the truth to the players. You don't get it out of books. You know, you don't have somebody tell you it so you can tell them. It's just players will inspire you to inspire them. They will. And if you know your players well enough, they're going to do something to get you to try to inspire them or to interact with them in a way to get a result. There is this thing which you call the toxic what? Right. The toxic resentment. It's all part of it. And it, after a certain period of time, <coughs> with, the, <coughs> with the raw edge of personality in that kind of cohesion, uh, what, a coach has only X number of years where he can continue to do that because it grows old, because something happens? Right. It happens in life. I mean, teamwork is the essence of life in all, in all aspects of life. And there is, uh, I'm writing this book, and the book will be out in September, and it's called The Winter Within. And it's about ten specific themes. And it starts with an innocent climb, and it ends with moving on. And in that process, when you start with a team innocently, when everything is fresh and there are no hidden agendas and everybody is for everybody and uh, there's voluntary cooperation and you're creating an environment in which everybody can flourish, and then that all changes overnight as soon as the numbers come in, right? As soon as there's success. And then as soon as there's change. So there's innocence and there's growth and there's inevitable change. And what happens over the process of being part of a team. And this happened in Los Angeles, and it happened at IBM, and it happened with all companies, and it happened with television programs. Yeah. And it does, is that this process of change, where people change, and some people change more radically than others, not just because they're getting older or more economically viable or socially prominent or more powerful or whatever it is, the changes that develop within a team over the process of success inevitably always break it down to a bitter end. Toxic resentment, toxic envy, it just breaks down that way. And what this book talks about is, is it talks about recognizing these things and how to short circuit them and how to, to read them coming. You don't have to go through that. Why can't a team go for 20 years? Why does it always have to break down? I mean, I mean the 80s was a perfect decade where it, where it started you know, it's what I call the disease of me. You know, you know, greed is good. We remember you can have anything you want in life. You just don't have to work for it. You know, I mean, values change, but you don't have to really make something. You can do it on paper. Yeah, it's it's uh, re toxic resentment. You know, is born out of success, and it is born out of those people involved with that team who simply have lost the ability to tolerate one another anymore or to understand or to grow anymore. And that's when your team and the fiber of the team begins to break But is it more down. tolerating each other or yeah. tolerating the coach or including the coach? Whatever. You're all a mass. You're yeah. a family. And, and you just begin to lose the spirit of, you know, I mean, the spirit of uh, what the whole thing is about. You know, if you were to draw, you know, three circles, I, I always put a circle at the bottom, and it, in, in the, that bottom circle would be the word it. And then in this circle up here in this corner would be the New York Knicks. And then in this circle up here would be your life. And the only way you're ever going to be very, very happy in your life is that it really is born out of how you do in your career. And in a lot of ways, I mean, we take it home with us. And if you're successful in your career, if you're happy in your career, you're happy in your work, I mean, it's going to really reflect on your life. And the only way you can make this career work is that you've got to develop this, what I call the spirit of, this it. It's an attitude more than anything else. It's an attitude that comes from inside. And it's it, an attitude it's, that? That comes from inside. Yeah. You cultivate it, you develop it, and you bring that attitude to everything you do in your life. You bring it to every single aspect of your life, and people read that. They know that what you're about is real, and they know that what you're teaching the Knicks is real, and that's part of your life.
It can't be different. And, and you get into the spirit of this, the spirit of unity, the spirit of tolerance, the spirit of understanding. Whatever it is that you have to get into as a team player, you simply get into it. You're either in or you're out. And there's no riding the fence. And when you get players that begin to ride the fence, you know, then they get out of it. And when they get out of it, then they should be the ones that leave. You shouldn't have to get them to go. Did this kind of conflict even come with, say, between you and Magic? No. Not Magic. No. I, I think... I think Anytime you leave an organization, you have no platform in which to defend yourself anymore because you've lost the authority base in a way. So, you know, once I left the organization, I knew what was going to happen. You know, all the daggers and all the darts, you know, just followed me out the door because, you know, there was a lot of resentment there. And it's just, you know, the thing that disappointed me most about, about leaving the Lakers is that we had a great decade. We won more games in that history of that decade than anybody in the history of the NBA. We won championships. We celebrated. We cried. We had all of those wonderful moments that you go through as a team. And I wanted what I, I think is almost impossible today because of, of how the media scrutinizes everything, is that for us to be responsible for that decade and to remember that decade is a great decade and to protect one another, protect the team, protect the legacy, protect the greatness. You know, once we, we all get old and we leave and we change, is get into a room, sit down, have a cup of coffee and say, hey, it's wonderful. Yeah. You know, good luck. See you along, you know, along the way. They don't let it happen that way. And that's probably what hurt me more than anything else. The Magic and I were kindred spirits. I mean, we were kindred spirits in, in a lot of ways. I mean, he was the great point guard, but he and I had gotten to a point where we would think alike, and, and there is nothing but mutual respect uh, there. I don't care what has been printed, uh, that will always be there, as the feeling that I have with all the other players, too. There is, it, says about, it is said about Magic that on that team, there came a time in which he realized that in order for him to achieve his goal, world championship, he had to help others realize right. their goal. You know, which meant being a passer rather than a scorer yeah. in part, right? Well, I, I think that's true for, for all great players or great people that want to win, that really know what it takes to win. It's, it's almost, a, it's a, it's a, you know, people have a tendency to chase things. I mean, ambition is a, it's a disease in a way where people will always you know, what am I going to get out of this? I will give to you, but what am I going to get out of it? What are you going to give me back? And, I mean, that's the way it is in America, and so be it. So it's a very competitive society that we live in. But, you know, they're chasing success, and they're chasing money and position and power and prestige and all these things that they think are important, and they are to an extent. But, but Irvin never really chased any of those things. What he wanted to do was to win, and he knew that if, if he could win all those things that maybe people want, you see, they just sort of follow you. You don't have to chase them. They right. just sort of follow you if, you if you have a passion about your work. He wanted to win. He, he loved winning. And he knew that, and, and, and it came to him young in his life, and that's why he was so unique. At 19, he brought this attitude mm -hmm. that I talk about right. that comes from within. The it. The it. He brought it with him, and he brought it to every single aspect of his life. He cultivated it, and he brought it. And what his desire was, was to take what he had learned, or even to use his skills, to make the other players on the team successful, and to help players on his team get out of the game what they desire. He wanted James Worthy to be an all-star. He wanted Byron Scott to lead the league, or the team in scoring one year. He wanted Kareem to get 35 points. He wanted all these players to get out of the game what they desired, because he knew that if they got out of the game what they desired, that they would be successful, and you know what? The team would win. And, if and the that's team what he won, wanted. Yeah, and if the team won, everything would follow him. You know, and the very first year when he was in L.A. as a rookie, you know, he brought this attitude and this desire, this desire. And when we won the championship, and it was this innocent climb, this beautiful, innocent climb, the owner gave him $25 million. It was the biggest contract in the history of the league. He never asked for it. And the owner gave him, hey, here's $25 million. And he said, I don't want it. You know why? Because everybody's going to get upset. Yeah. And they did. The disease of me began to crop up. You know, but, I mean, he took it. 
but he wasn't chasing that, you see. I mean, and I think that's what teamwork is about. That's the essence of teamwork. If you can get people that get into the spirit of voluntarily cooperating everything they have to make the team win, it's the hardest thing in the world to do is to get people to do the things they don't want to do in order to achieve what the team wants. If you can get half your people to do that, you're on your way. You is this the way. conversation you had with Patrick Ewan when you took the job as head coach of the Knicks? We talked about some of these things. I mean, uh, I mean, when, when Pat and I sat down, I mean, it was a very tenuous time here with him and with his yeah. contract and with the team. And, and you didn't want to be coaching the Knicks if he wasn't going to no, be there. I really didn't. But I would have probably because I, I had no recourse. But uh, I didn't really have to convince him. Pat has, he has a tremendous integrity. He really does. And, you know, he has, he has been mirrored, you know, in, in this image that has been created about him as a distant, very quiet, moody superstar. Uh, it's really the antithesis of, of what he, he is. I mean, he, he is a private person, but he, he's private because he's preparing all the time. And, and he doesn't want to deal with, with all the peripheral distractions of the game. But he looked at me and he said to me, he said, Coach, he said, why is it going to be any different with you? He said, I had six other coaches tell me the same thing. They came in and they sat me down. It's going to be different. <laughs> You know, and uh, and I couldn't guarantee him anything. I, I could not. Well, I what just, did you tell him? I told him about a dream <laughs> that I had. And uh, I don't even know if that had an impact on him, but he was sitting there with his wife, Rita, and, and I told him about this vision. And, and, and that's the way I am. I mean, I mean, I'm this dreamer. I visualize everything. I, I see it every single day. And, and, and actually, a year before I got the job with the New York Knicks, I... I I visualized that I would get that was going to be my next job. I the knew Knicks. It was, yeah, I knew it was going to be my next job, and I didn't know. I mean, I knew the job would open someday because it opened six times in five years. So I think it would be open again. And once the job opened again, maybe uh, I could become a candidate for it. But I kept visualizing this opportunity, and and as I would run up and down the beach in California, and I was working for NBC at the time. I kept visualizing talks that I had with the team, talks that I had with Patrick Ewing, Mark Jackson, Charles Oakley. I knew what I was going to say to them. Uh, I told them about the vision of, uh, I don't know what street they go down. Is it Broadway? Is it Fifth Avenue? I saw the confetti coming out, you know. I said, one day we're going to have that here. And I, and, uh, I don't know. I, I just, I think Patrick may at that time have said, well, you know, maybe he's going to bring something. The only thing I brought from Los Angeles was some credibility because we had won. And, um, and, and, and he made the commitment. It was, it was him that made the commitment to stay. Did it rankle you at all that there were some people who would say, L.A., great, great team, but great players, not necessarily great coaching? Never. It never bothered you for a second because you knew different, because you knew what it had taken to deal with those men to bring them to the thing you just talked about. You knew. Yeah, I knew. And, 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 and I they think, knew. And the players knew. So when somebody so, said anybody can win the national championship yeah. or the world championship with Magic. I got more Kareem. annoyed with it more than anything else. I, I, I became annoyed with always having to defend you know, our success and what I did out there or what I was part of. Uh, I mean, I got more credit than any coach in the history of the NBA for not getting enough credit. <laughs> you know, and, so, and that in itself was enough. And, uh, and so I was constantly, you know, always answering this yeah. question about, about having to prove myself. And, um, and so I, I, I don't think in those terms. You know, after five years of coaching, I knew what I was. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I had a passion to coach. You knew when you were coaching the Lakers that, that in your head you were a lifer, even then? No, no. Yeah. You know now you're a lifer. I, I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't, I'm not sure. I think you make that decision after 20 years, you know. I mean, I mean, you know that your life is a coach. I don't, like Dick Carter, who's my assistant coach, yeah. 37 years. I don't know if I can say 37 <laughs> years, you know, or Chuck Daly, 35 years, you know, or, you know, I mean, Lenny Wilkins now is going on, on 19 or 20 years, and yeah. there are men that, I mean, you got to have some staying power, yeah. <laughs> okay, to stay in this thing that long, but right now, I know in my life, there isn't anything 
else that I could do that could give me the kind of lift, you know, that this gives me. What is it? Tell me the feeling. It's being, it's being, it's being down there in the middle of Madison Square Garden, you know, with 12 guys in a war. You know, it's, you know, it's not do or die. I mean, do or die was the code of survival, you know, to men, you know, in Vietnam or the Second World War. I mean, it meant something. Do or die meant something, you know, that cliche or that phrase. Mm. Uh, do or die in sports, you know, is, is more of a code of anything else. It's, uh, you know, honor and sacrifice and all these things. But it's, it's 12 guys who make a commitment somewhere and sports being the toy department of human affairs and life, a lot of people look at it that way. But you got 12 guys that have a goal and they have a commitment. When you get down there and you're on the floor and they're at 19,000 and you're in it with them, you're in it, and they're playing as hard as they can play, it's, uh, it's exhilarating. And I could not replace that with anything the else. The emotion, the charge, the feeling, watching guys, the test. Yeah, watching guys give everything they have to give you know, I mean, the emotions, I mean, it, it's an up and down thing. I mean, every night there's a result. You win or you lose, and, you know, you go home. Uh, Red Holtzman was, was telling me the other day, and he's, <laughs> he only, only Red could put it in the words. He looked at me and he smiled. You know, we won 60, but we lost to Chicago. And he said, Riles, he said, you got to learn how to suffer the wins. <laughs> and, you know, it just hit me. I know what he's talking about. Because I don't enjoy the wins, you see. I, I know, mean. and that's why I want to ask you, because you have said two things. One, there's winning and there's misery. Right. But you've also said there is no joy in this. It's, it, it's but you've just described it's the only thing you want to do. It, this seems a little bit contradictory to me. It's the only it thing you want to do. It's the ultimate contradiction. Yeah, joy in your misery. Yeah. There's a lot of people <laughs> in this world like that. There's a lot of people who live in New York. <laughs> joy and misery. <laughs> joy and misery. Jo no, joy in your misery. Yeah, joy in your misery. But uh, you're saying there's no joy in this thing. There is a tremendous amount. It's the amount only of, place right. I want to be. It, 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 you, know, I, I'm, you know, I think you try to put it in that perspective because I think if you come into the NBA and, and you get into this kind of profession, and, and it's a, hey, lolly, gagging, easy, wonderful ride. Let's just get on, you know, the train and go. I think you're going to be more miserable than you've ever been. The players have to understand that to win a championship is going to be the most difficult thing you will ever do in your life. The most difficult thing that you've ever done in your life. You have to give up everything. You have to sacrifice everything. You have to do things that you've never done as a professional player. You have to work harder, get in better shape. You have to endure. You have to do these things in order to win. And any team that endures like this, it's not easy. It's, it's not. You find your moments during the season where the team can take solace in their success and they can, they can really be together. And, and I think that's why there was so much disappointment this year, because I think the players gave that kind of mental effort. And when they didn't get it, there was great disappointment. And I think when you're there in that emotion, you're on your way. So, yes, there's joy in it. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean a, a good friend of mine puts it this way. I mean, you have that attitude, but there has to be an attitude with gratitude. Once the season was over with, and we went through the misery of four or five days of, of losing this thing, uh, I am grateful for being part of this team and being part of this group of guys. I mean, I, I really have a feeling of gratitude that I'm part of an organization that is this committed to this call. And we had a great year. The guys should enjoy and bask in the limelight of this New York Knicks success. But can you? Yes. You can. You can yes. go around and write your book and lecture and think about next year. Right. There'll be another theme. That's right. There'll be another, another theme. theme. There'll be another theme next year. What's that the will, theme? I don't know yet, but it will come this summer. There'll be another reason to go above and beyond. Well, but the theme in this year was, the past year was what? Well, the first year it was a theme that I stole from a friend of mine called Awaken the Giant, okay? <laughs> Tony Robbins. <laughs> 
Is, oh, this uh, is Tony Robbins, the guy who's on right, television. Right, Fran right. He wrote a book called to... Awaken the Giant, and, yeah. and I thought it was a wonderful theme, Awaken the Giant. Not the giant, but Awaken the Giant, the giant in, in New, New York. York. Right, okay. In New York, in the city. And that's why I think this team has embraced uh, this town. The, the, oh, the town has embraced it. Either or. I mean, they have done both. I mean, there was always a very adversarial Is it country. that different than it is with the Lakers in the Forum? Is it different than it is with the... Bulls in well, in a way. Chicago. I mean, for instance, I mean, when I was approached last year by the marketing department, yeah. and they were they wanted to sort of talk to me about their ad campaign for the Knicks, and so one of the one of the drawings, you know, was a picture of the basket looking down in the lane, and then in the lane there was a chalk line of a dead person, <laughs> you know. Tough town, tough team, right? Yeah. I mean, we didn't want to go that far, okay? I mean, <laughs> driving the lane is one thing, but we didn't want to draw chalk lines down the lane. That, <laughs> that we but, leave them dead. Uh, there's, there's a lot more passion in this town. Than any town. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot more energy. I mean, you got to give them what they want. Uh, I think Nick fans come to the garden to watch you win. They don't come to watch a game. They want to see a good game, but they want to watch you win. And I just think that's a byproduct of being part of New York. People in New York want to win, and, you know, you got to yeah. understand that. You said Michael Jordan is the best, yeah. the best ever played the game until, except for Kareem, or until, or since Kareem and the Skyhook. Not better, not the best ever to play the game, period. They're different players. Uh, I think Michael Jordan <coughs> is, uh, is the greatest player to ever play the game, but I don't think he's the greatest weapon. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had the greatest weapon. He had the cruise missile, okay? I mean, it was unstoppable, the skyhook. When you think about decorum and character and integrity and the will to win, which he has in enormous amounts, how do you characterize the gambling thing for him? Is that a flaw, character flaw? I don't think it's a character flaw. You know, I have, I have great respect, great respect for Michael Jordan. Our whole approach against the Chicago Bulls is to let our team know that the worst thing that can happen in their careers is that you were born the same time that he was born and that you might have to play against him for 10 years <laughs> and can never beat him. Yeah. See, I know what it was like now for... Nobody, I mean, some of the players who were great players in the Western Conference that could never beat Magic or Kareem, and we, were, we dominated for a long time. So no matter how good, you would never know the thrill of ultimate you victory. You can't beat him. So mm -hmm. we have to beat Michael Jordan. Be before Patrick Ewing is ever going to win a championship, he's got to learn how to beat Michael Jordan. As far as, as the gambling thing goes, I think when you're that kind of player, you're beyond above reproach. Above? You have to be. I don't know if I clarified that right, but I think there's an obligation on his part that he has to be above all that stuff. I mean, or beyond it, or that he, he can't allow this to become part of So it's of his, his responsibility. Life. Yes. Yes, I did. Now, as far as, as far as people, you know, getting on his case about whether he has a problem, I don't think anybody has the right to say that he has a problem. But when you're in that spotlight, with that kind of heat, and you're that kind of role model, then when that happens, then you've got to pay the price for it. It's been a very fast hour. <laughs> Pleasure to have you here. Pat Riley. Okay, Joe. You'll be back you're, when the book yes. is finished. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's done. Uh, Pat Riley, uh, the Knicks coach, and almost uh, a primer on coaching and character and integrity and a lot of other things. We thank you for joining us tomorrow night when we visit WLA Television Channel 32 in New Orleans. Good night.